don't think it's a, a good idea. I think, uh, you know, both as far as America's interest and, you know, uh, basically uh, ensuring our security as American citizens, I think it's going to prove to be unfortunate because I think uh, Al-Qaeda and others will go back to uh, a safe haven that uh, Afghanistan becomes and plots against us. And I personally don't believe that uh, it rang true for all of us that are veterans. I mean, many of them want to get out, and I'm a huge believer in, in not having forever wars. You know, my dad served uh, – as a civilian after he retired from the Army and planning for the Ministry of Defense there in Kabul. And obviously, I served in Afghanistan. My son served in Afghanistan. Three generations of Schlossers out there doing that, and I don't believe in doing that forever. But I do believe that uh, we owe it to our vets to make sure that uh, when we do change out uh, – our, our interest, or if we decide to leave wars that we've served in, especially those for two two decades, that we do it in the right way. And uh, I'm not sure we've done it the right way this time. Well, it looks like from what I've been reading, General, that we're going to walk out and leave millions of tons of ammunition and armament just all, in warehouses on the ground, not doing anything to take it with us. Um, I, but it, I Go ahead, sir. Well, I just wanted to say, you know, I'm not sure about the weapons or or the ammunition. I think that, uh, you know, I think that they'll do the very best they can to remove that or, or as it sounds crazy, but they'll destroy it on site. Um, I'll never forget the first time I went to Bagram uh, Air Base. By the way, Bagram had been the site of the Soviet uh, invasion as well. And I saw, you know, MiGs and helicopters and tanks uh, destroyed out in the middle of the air base uh, after they left. And I, my belief is, is that, we won't leave those kinds of things, but Humvees and trucks and stuff like that. Yeah, it will be there and more likely than not will be captured by the Taliban. So the gist of what you're saying, uh, you know, the intent is, is correct. I mean, you know, uh, we leave behind a lot of supplies more likely than not. Uh, they'll either be captured uh, or just seized. Yeah. General, there's, uh, there's another issue that, that I, I've been writing about for some time. Um, about the, the, the departure from Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria. Um, since Joe Biden has taken office, the price of West Texas intermediate crude has gone from as high, from about $42 a barrel to a high of, of 70 something. It's pulled back recently when OPEC decided that they're gonna uh, ramp up production a little bit. But the, the problem I have, General, is that one of the reasons why I believe we had a strategic interest in the Middle East was that we were dependent upon Middle Eastern oil to run our economy. When we started, the private sector began to develop the resources in the United States, and we reached the point under Donald Trump that we were energy independent as a nation. We didn't need the oil. But what's happened is we've got a, a, a double hit here. We're taking out our military through the Middle East, but at the same time, we're cutting our resources so that we're no longer very quickly energy independent. And what we're doing is we're sending money to the, to the Arab nations to buy oil, which they can in turn use to fund the terrorists to attack us. And I don't understand the logic of doing that. Yeah, I'm no expert on uh, the oil economics here, uh, Dan. But well, let me just say that I am a big believer that, uh, you know, we have a presence in the Middle East, uh, not just in Iraq and Afghanistan, Afghanistan being Southwest Asia, but also Kuwait, uh, Syria, Iraq clearly uh, has, you know, caused us to be involved in other places like Qatar and things of that nature. And obviously Saudi Arabia, we do that on purpose. We have national interests, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have to do with security interests, like uh, trying to make sure that Iran doesn't uh, become a regional, regional uh, hegemon that uh, hurts, you know, both global trade as well as the security of, uh, of our uh, friends and allies in the region. But, we also, you know, we try to do it so that uh, it makes sense for American security, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want people planning things overseas and things of that nature. 
Uh, you know, we've long, as you said, we've long been involved in trying to secure a free to free flow of, uh, of hydrocarbons, oil, natural gas, and things like that out of the uh, that area of the world. Um, whether we use it or not, uh, you know, the rest of the world uh, uh, still needs oil, and uh, you can have oil spikes if uh, you have uh, things that are hindered that way. I'm obviously a big supporter uh, as an American of uh, whatever of you know energy independence in my own country. Mm-hmm. And I think that that was a wise thing to do as far as, you know, uh, fracking and things of that nature. Again, I'm not an environmental uh, specialist, so I don't want our listeners thinking that I'm making an environmental statement. I'm not. I'm talking about national security. Right. Um, you know, so anyway, I, I understand fully what you just said. And, uh, you know, and while I'm no expert on oil and things like that, I, I do remind everybody that, you know, the, we went into the Middle East, you know, decades and decades ago after World War II on purpose We've been involved there ever since for real reasons that uh, have to do with our own security and, and, and our own economy. And, uh, right. you know, we can, we can walk away if we want to, but it's a bad choice and it will hurt us. Right. I want to move on, if I could, General, to uh, um, something that I've been also writing a lot about recently, and that is the idea uh, of instructing the military in critical race theory and, and white supremacy. Uh, we've got the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which uh, I can't believe what I'm hearing from him. Um, the idea that we're trying to indoctrinate, uh, and that's what it is, indoctrination by teaching that whites are ha, have been against blacks, have been white supremacists from the founding of our country, um, and that... Um, White should have no power. I, I'm just amazed uh, that we that the military would adopt a philosophy of teaching critical race soldiers, critical race theory to soldiers. Yeah, I don't think. You know, well, one, I, I personally don't believe it's actually happening out there. You know, among our soldiers, as far as privates and people going through basic training and stuff. And you know, Dan, I think you probably know that I, I started off in the army as a private. How I made it to a two-star is anybody's guess, but uh, I was proud to retire as a major general. But what I'll say is that you know, whether it's a college education, you know, the military academies or whatever, I, I really don't know the facts on that. What I will say, though, is is that I believe our military is stronger and better. Uh, one, when we represent what our country looks like, but two, that doesn't require a whole lot of, uh, you know, I, what I'm just saying is we need to be diverse, and we are diverse. Our military is extraordinarily diverse, uh, but we also need to be strong. And, and we're not a social economic experiment uh, when you're in the military. Your Army, your Marine Corps, airmen and sailors and stuff like that need to concentrate on what they have signed up to do, which is to train uh, for war, train for combat, um, and it's not a social economic experiment, and uh, and I don't believe that we're stronger for that. So, you know, again, I, I'm not a uh, you know economist. I'm not a social sociologist. I'm a military guy that trained all my life to protect America, and that's what I my opinions are best at. But uh, I just think we're a stronger military when we concentrate on things like that. General, when I entered the military uh, in the late 1960s, even at that time. The army, that's which is where I was in, the army was racially diverse. And and there was black leadership uh, from platoon sergeants to sergeant majors to officers. Um, I mean, I, I, I was in the military at a time, and it's probably even more diverse today than it was when I went in in the, in the late 60s. But Eisenhower desegregated the, the, the military when he was president and before. So I just don't see the idea that we want to instruct the, the, the soldiers about diversity and racial diversity when the <laughs> most likely general, the military, was desegregated faster and more than any other part of the country. Yeah, I mean, I agree, Dan. I mean, you know, I'm a little bit behind you. I came in in the mid-'70s. My dad was... Uh... Army of Occupation, Germany, Korea, and then three tours in Vietnam. So I lived my whole life on military bases. And uh, that's who I grew up with. It was with a very diverse group of uh, kids, uh, you know, whose parents were involved in the Army. And, and we represented America then, and I still think that the military does a great job of representing America now. 
Um, so, I mean, I, you know, yeah, it's already diverse. I, I totally agree with you. And, uh, okay. and again, I can't speak to this, uh, these ideas of these theories and stuff like that. I haven't studied the theories. I don't know anything about them and I'm not a sociologist, so I'm not going to speak to them, but I will say, if you're going to basic training in the Army these days, I would be shocked if you're being trained about or being indoctrinated in this stuff. I just don't I, – I wouldn't understand why, and I wouldn't think it's prudent, and I just don't think that's happening, though. I, I hope not as an American citizen. Okay. Back to you, Jim. So IQ Rizzoli. Hey, yes. Go, go, go Jim, ahead, I, Major I, General. I just want to thank Dan for what he's doing for all of our vets and our active folks uh, on suicide. It is very, very real. Uh, you know, we all come back from combat different than when we went, and I just want to thank Dan for doing that. My pleasure. I got to take care of my brothers and sisters. <laughs> you got it, and and, uh, and so do I, and so do all of us uh, American citizens. So thank IQ, you. Jim, back over to you. Uh, IQ, do you have any uh, any questions for the Major General? Are you, is that a rhetorical question? I've got a million of them. <laughs> now, while you have been in Afghanistan, uh, let me explain something to you, General. I come from Iraq originally, so my language is Arabic, and my knowledge of Islam is extremely, extremely good. While you were in Afghanistan, and now you left Afghanistan, what have you learned about Islam? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, I can't, first of all, you know, I did study, um, I, in fact, I actually studied Arabic for a while, although my Arabic is atrocious now. I've spent a lot of years uh, not speaking, so I, I've forgotten most. And I did study Islam a bit, uh, you know, uh, working on a master's degree there in uh, uh, Georgetown. I think, though, that what I saw was a reality that uh, Islam is, is actually diverse, you know, between Sunni and Shia, obviously, is very clearly diverse. But the way it's practiced throughout the world is very diverse. And I think that, uh, you know, you have to be accepting of that diversity within uh, uh, one of the three great religions of our, our globe. Um, and I would encourage Christians to pay attention to what uh, Islam is about. You know, uh, you know, the, the, they're all based on the same book, the same, uh, many of the sa same prophets and the idea of one God. So I think I learned an awful lot about the practicalities of that rather than, you know, just uh, some book learning. Thank you. But Islam is not the same as Judeo-Christianity. A Muslim. No, I didn't say that. Yeah. No, no. Well, it said uh, three religions. I'm right. not contradicting you. I'm trying to explain something to you. Please. In the Arabic language of the Quran, Allah is the God of Muhammad. They say that Allah is the same as the God of Jesus, Moses, and Abraham. When you study the Quran, not read it, study it, you will find out it is inconceivable that Allah is the same as the God of the Bible. And when you come to that, conclusion, Islam is not a religion. Islam is a cult belief system, the cult of Muhammad. And this is exactly the reason why every single Western country, whether it was Russia before or America now, or even France even, uh, in, in Muslim countries, they, they were defeated every time. Because you still do not understand what Islam is all about. And yet every single Muslim who commits mass murder, like ISIS, like Al-Qaeda, they are the true Muslims. And the news media tell you, no, they are not, they're extremists. They're not extremists. ISIS follows the Quran infinitely more than Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden followed the Quran word by word. ISIS follows the Quran letter by letter and dot by dot. And unless America comes to this conclusion, you're absolutely right. Before 9-11, the whole of Afghanistan will fall to the, to the mullahs of, the, the mullahs of the Taliban. And not only this, there will be a mass slaughter of people who help the Americans. And the worst people who will be hurt are the females. The women of Afghanistan, especially the ones who are against the uh, Taliban, will be raped and murdered. 
And this is not an exaggeration. I predicted it when Donald, when Biden said he will leave. I said it in my letters. I said it in my articles. I said it in my talk shows. There will be mass slaughter. And exactly what you said, it will be another center of training for jihadis. It's a disaster. I'm sorry well, to say I do. Well, I must say that your conclusions, I think, uh, you know, they sound horrific, but uh, they're quite unfortunate. But I do believe that uh, much of what you've said is absolutely going to happen. I think that, you know, there will be a civil war. There will be a great deal of, uh, of absolute chaos, uh, just like we've had before in Afghanistan. The Taliban will take advantage of that, but clearly so will al-Qaeda, Islamic State, other uh, groups of that nature. And the people that have grown up for two decades thinking that they had a future in Afghanistan, mainly, you know, uh, or not mainly, but the, the people that have been able to take advantage of education, take advantage of the medical care, take advantage of the increased life expectancy, take advantage of being able to be whatever they wanted to be, including all women, that's going to be crushed. And, uh, and I, and I'm, I wish I had a better feeling about it, but I do not. I, I agree with you, and I, and I believe it's highly, it's going to be a, a calamity. Unfortunately, you and I are both right. But the question I want to ask you again now, what is the advantage of Biden talking to the Ayatollahs of Iran? I'm trying to figure out, maybe you can help me. What is their single advantage for America talking to the Ayatollahs of Iran, who have wrecked destruction in my country, Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in the Yemen, and they're spreading, by the way, in Latin America. What do you think? Well, let me just say, um, you know, I, I, don't, I can't understand why this administration is trying to do exactly that, especially after the Iranians have already admitted that they have, uh, you know, already... Uh, enrich the uh, uranium to the point that it's uh, bordering weapons grade uh, uranium. And of course they have one of the biggest ballistic missile programs in the world. Uh, I'd like to remind everybody, and you know this already, I mean, uh, that Iran is no friend of the United States. They export uh, via the Hezbollah, via their proxy groups, via Quds Force, via a variety of other, uh, what I would say, malaligned, uh, maligned folks with, you know, uh, evil intent throughout the world. It's not just in the area around Iran. It, it is throughout, you know, the, our southern borders of South America. It's, it's elsewhere in Africa, etc. Iran has no love of America. They have no love of uh, any of our friends or our allies throughout the world. And that doesn't mean just the West. It means everybody. And I think we have to be very concerned about uh, what they are doing. Now, if, if negotiations can bring them to the table, maybe that's maybe somebody knows something way more than I do. And, and uh, but I do think that the Iranians will respect one thing, and that's strength. And I think we have to be very clear with them that uh, uh, there is no way they'll become a nuclear power. And uh, and uh, I think we need to be very clear with them that uh, we do not regard what they are doing throughout the world uh, with Hezbollah and Al-Quds Force, we do not regard that as good, and we are going to do everything we can to make it unsuccessful. And I'll leave it at that. I agree. Back to you, Dan. Yes, thank you. I, I, I did want to ask the, the general one more, or a couple more questions. Yeah, go ahead, uh, my friend. Um, general, you know, I, 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 I listened to your discussion with IQ, uh, and I, I, I hear what's going on, but there is a question that I have to ask that is very difficult for me to ask because I'm afraid you're going to tell me what I already know and you're going to scare people. We have an administration that is following the philosophy of Barack Obama to lead from behind, not lead the world. Do you think if Joe Biden maintains himself as president for the next three and a half years, sometime in that period, America will be attacked again. Let me just say, Dan, that I think that, uh, and again, I'm 
I am not going to get into the politics of this or any one administration, but let me just state what I think are the facts. When when we went in after 9-11 into Afghanistan, what we saw was that there was a safe haven for al-Qaeda. And so as we tried to capture and kill, and eventually did, it took a long time to get the nod, but uh, as we tried because of the role of Pakistan, but uh, as we pushed out al-Qaeda, captured, killed many of them, and we the Taliban refused to, you know, uh, stop supporting them. We had to get rid of the Taliban as well in Afghanistan. What we saw in, in Afghanistan was therefore just this kind of clean slate, no economy other than poppy, no real government other than what the Taliban had, had uh, implemented through their interpretation of uh, Islam. And, and what we are unfortunately seeing happen right in front of us right now, if we're paying attention, is we're going to get back to this potential of having a safe haven for al-Qaeda and other nations like Islamic State, who, by the way, Islamic State has no love for the Taliban. But uh, we are setting ourselves up again for a safe haven outside of our borders where we are not going to be able to keep constant eyes on and constant pressure and from time to time take out those planners and those that are plotting against us. And I, I fear exactly what you say that uh, we could, within a handful of years, again, at least see plots against our nation. Uh, that uh, that it's uh, very unfortunate that uh, we're allowing this to happen. Thank we you. Have, we have got a great guest with us today. So, so Jeffrey, tell us about some of the different um, reviews you've gotten on this book and everything. Well, you know, I think, uh, thanks, Jim. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, the people that are watching over Afghanistan, obviously, are, I want to read the book and, and, and want to hear the book. You know, you can get it on audiobook, et cetera. And, and of course, I've been talking to a lot of the uh, uh, talk shows about it. I think some people are also looking a little bit longer term and like the book, you know, because the book is also about what war does to all, all of us, whether we go to fight it and then, or what it does to our families. And then how do you overcome the chaos of leading in really uncertain environments where it can be brutal. And so, you know, I wrote it for two different reasons. I really wrote it to, you know, uh, honor the people that uh, both served and passed away, died, as well as those that are living, and then also to try to help others be better leaders by becoming better persons and then understanding what it's like when you have really, uh, you know, tough, tough uh, events. It doesn't need to be war. It could be, heck, I mean, the book is just as good for a business leader uh, facing a COVID crisis or something like that. And I, I think that latter part, I still don't see as many people, you know, taking a hard look at it and going, my gosh, some of the things he says about leadership really do ring true. And I wish that would be something that uh, would happen more. But I, uh, right now, a lot of attention about Afghanistan, and I clearly understand why, because if you look at the book, you'll see I make predictions uh, that are coming true. Absolutely. And where amazing. do we get the book? Yeah, where do we get the book? Okay. Easiest place is to go right online. You get that favorite place, uh, Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com, or if you like uh, independent books, go to Indie.com, SimonSchuster.com. Those are the easiest ways to do that, and you can also get the best prices. Fantastic. Well, as we wrap up here with everybody, I want to start with Dan. Bring us up to speed on your nonprofit and radio programs, TV shows, everything. <laughs> we don't have much time left. <laughs> um, uh, the the soldiers program is songs and stories for soldiers. Us. As I said to the general, we work in the area of traumatic brain injury, PTSD, uh, suicide prevention, and sleep deprivation, which is really the unmentioned problem with with uh, not only with soldiers, general, but with the general public. Sleep, sleep deprivation is a major, major medical problem in our country today. Um, the Blacks and Whites uh, just crossed 4 million listeners, and our show tomorrow at 12.30 on blacksandwhites.us will deal with the idea that the Biden administration wants to use Facebook to eavesdrop on your instant messages and your email to see if you're one of those people who, are, who is anti-vaccine. 
uh, we have a lawyer who's going to talk to us. I have grave concerns that uh, this is basically smoke for an invasion of the First Amendment rights, and the administration is trying to do a lot of other things. And um, uh, more about me as the as the writer and everything else. My commentaries are available at danperkins.guru, G-U-R-U. And General, thanks for joining us today. And, and Dan, again, thanks for everything you're doing on our vets and our active folks. Really do appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, IQ, how do we get your books and get involved with everything you're doing, my friend? Well, as you know, my books are related mostly about Islam. All you have to do is Google my name, Al Rasuli, A L R A S O O L I, and everything is free. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us, General. IQ, great talking to you, and thank you for also being on the show. General, I would suggest when you have some time, get his. It's a three book trilogy. It's a fascinating reading from somebody from a person who actually lived it as a person from Iraq and, and lived in that attitude and desolation that took place in that country. It, it, I've read them and, and they're really quite good. So airplane reading. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thanks for your support. Thank well, you. Well, uh, <laughs> well, Marathon War is an incredible book. Uh, do you have any, any more information you want to give the, the folks here, my friend, before we let you go for today? Yeah, Jeb, I would just say, you know, if people go to jeffschlosser.com, you know, it's last night, J-E-F-F-S-C-H-L-O-E-S-S-E-R. I've got a weekly blog. In fact, Dan, you got to take a look at it. I About three weeks ago, I talked about PTSD, made some, you know, very personal, you know, uh, comments about my own, you know, stress and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um uh, and, you know, PTSD and things like that, and in the way ahead. But I, I would just encourage people, if, if you're uncertain about whether you're interested in buying Marathon War, go to that blog site. And uh, also the author site tells you a lot about the book as well. And then you can make a determination from that. Or nevertheless, if you, you know, you don't want to spend any money, just read my blogs. It's free. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Major General, this has been a fascinating conversation today. Thanks to IQ. Thanks to Dan. And uh, thanks to the Major General. Thank you, my friend. No, thank you, and thanks for having thank me you. on the show. Appreciate okay. it. There they go. And okay. uh, that is that. I want to thank everybody for paying attention to us today. Check out JiggyJaguar.com for more information. And we will see.